This is a footage of a coronal mass ejection, or a CME, captured by NASA. What you see here is basically the sun sneezing. And just like in any sneeze, when a CME happens, it ejects a lot of nice and tasty particles. But most importantly, this is Earth in size comparison. Usually, when CMEs happen, they almost never hit Earth, even if they happen once or twice a week. That's because they are ejected to all directions. And when I say usually, it's changing. This year and the next, the Sun is slowly reaching its cycle maximum. And that means it will start producing 2 to 3 CMEs per day. When I first found this interesting news, my brain started boiling with questions like what happens if they hit us, what are their risks, and how can we prevent them? So I researched, and what I found was a bunch of interesting science, stories from when the sun was not very nice with Earth in the past, and of course, the likelihood of catastrophic CMEs and how scientists are working to prevent their devastations. So take a seat, and let me show you. My name is Khalid, and I talk about interesting science. CMEs happen all the time at the surface of our sun. In other words, business as usual. But one hit is usually more than enough to make serious damages, even a medium-sized one. That's what SpaceX found the hard way in February 2022. They had just launched a train of 49 Starlink satellites the third, just when a medium-sized CME was arriving to Earth. And even if it was a medium one, it hit hard, and you guessed it, caused many satellites to be destroyed. You can see CMEs as clouds of matter ejected from the sun, and since this matter is in plasma form, it carries a lot of energy and a very strong magnetic field. Many on the internet confuse CMEs with solar flares, those super bright flashes, or even with solar prominences that look like eruptions. And while both flares and prominences can cause CMEs or happen in the same time, it's not automatic. What scientists know so far of CMEs formation is that they happen due to magnetic fields snapping on the surface of the sun. They don't fully understand these mechanics, only that they seem to increase during solar cycle maximums. But when they snap, they send those massive plasma clouds into space, and sometimes towards Earth. What happened in February 2022 with SpaceX was even more surprising. It was not only one, but two CMEs that hit Earth and caused a cascade of events. Earth's magnetic field got deformed quite a lot and caused large perturbations shown in green in this NASA animation. And although this was not the surprising part, I included this because these fluctuations are the most dangerous to our technologies down here on Earth. But we will get to that in a minute. What actually knocked out the Starlink satellites was another effect. During the first CME, the plasma created an unexpected effect when reaching Earth. Scientists calculated that the atmosphere density increased by 20 to 30 percent at an altitude of 200 kilometers and even 160 percent in certain regions. Obviously, that massively increased the drag. And since the satellites were just launched, they were still way too low, approximately 130 kilometers. Needless to say, they had no chances to survive the increased drag caused by this inflation of the atmosphere. 38 of them were destroyed this day. Even more surprising with this story is NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, had issued this warning, expecting a CME. So did SpaceX miss the warning, or maybe just ignored it? Difficult to say. Especially that even if scientists can see them forming, and we'll get to that later, they actually cannot really predict their impact, at least with certainty. NOAA communicates risks on a scale of 1 to 5 for CMEs, solar flares, and radio bursts. 
The one that hit Starlink was only a G2, but even a G5 CME only tells us a risk of certain effects happening, not how hard they will be. The smallest impacts go from pretty much nothing or small disruptions to GPS, so your phone could think you are in your neighbor's living room. Or worse, CMEs can also trigger alerts in the International Space Station, so astronauts can shelter in the more protected modules. But even in this case, experience shows they are almost as protected by Earth's magnetic field as we are down here, which is different for the cosmic rays and would be a different story if they were, say, on the Moon or Mars. But that's a subject for another time. No, the worst impacts seen so far are actually on the ground. The main effects are two. Power outages, as in 1989 event in Quebec, because transformers do not really like power surges. Or internet loss, if the CME is powerful enough to impact the copper lines surrounding optical fibers. And the reason we know of their destructive potential is because Earth was already hit by severe ones in the past. You probably know the most famous one from 1859, the Carrington event. It's famous because it was the most powerful ever directly recorded on Earth, and the first one directly observed, actually by this guy. Plenty of videos already explain it in detail, so no need for me to add the boring here by expanding on it. But in summary, it was so powerful that it alone supercharged the entire telegraph network. Operators still exchanged messages over long distances even when the power was shut down. It caused auroras as south as Cuba, China and Japan, where these drawings were produced and as north as Australia. They were so bright, they lit the nights and people woke up and started their day. And last but not least, its energy was the equivalent of a millennium of humanity's power needs. So, imagine it happening today. And if back then, Carrington, the British astronomer who observed it, drew the sunspots that caused it on paper, Fortunately, times and technologies have changed, and nowadays we observe the sun not only from ground telescopes, but also from space. There are currently many satellites specializing in studying the sun, so I will focus here only on the ones orbiting the L1 Lagrange point at 1.5 million kilometers distance, or roughly a million miles between Earth and the sun. GGS, also nicknamed WIND, is a NASA satellite launched in 1994 that specializes in studying radio waves, plasma, and solar wind. ACE, launched in 1997, is also from NASA. It studies energetic particles from solar wind and other sources. DISCOVER was launched in 2015 and is currently the primary warning system for NASA in the event of solar magnetic storms. It also studies solar wind, plasma, and CMEs. A fun fact about this cover, or perhaps not so fun depending on you, who knows. This satellite is nicknamed Gorsat after Al Gore. I don't know much about him except that he seems to be either super loved or super hated, but I don't care. In 1998, when he was vice president, he made a proposal to add a specific camera to Discover. Its name is Epic and since it's pointed towards Earth, its main objective was to update the blue marble picture taken by Apollo 17. And indeed it did, much more than that. I actually think this was a genius idea after all. Because what we got is this, some of the most stunning pictures of Earth and the Moon. Here you can see it passing in front of our blue marble. And you can even see the Moon shadow during eclipses. And last but not least of our satellite list is SOHO, launched by ESA in 1994. Even if it's old, it was already covering a large spectrum of studies, from Sun's inner structure probing, CMEs, solar winds, and even Sun seismology. Honestly, I had no idea this field existed until I researched this video. And a uh, small detail, additional detail, which is SOHO in my 3D is not 100% accurate. Its orbit should be horizontal um, around L1 Lagrange point and not vertical. But again, as I said, detail, who cares? 
What we care about is, despite being quite old as its instruments were built in the 80s, SOHO actually discovered half of the comets we currently know. This is because it was one of the first able to create a solar eclipse to hide the glare from the sun directly within its camera, also called a coronagraph. And of course there are other objects humanity sent like the Indian Aditya, the NASA SDO and others directly orbiting the sun like the Parker Solar Probe. Now, thanks to these satellites we can really study the sun very closely. This already helped improve in our knowledge of the sun and discover many powerful events, and some happened very recently. So far this year alone, NOAA already issued seven events notifications for CMEs or solar flares that could have disrupted phone communications for example. In July 2012, a small CME was ejected from the sun, only to clean solar wind for two other massive CMEs probably as powerful as the Carrington event. They missed Earth by 9 days only and hit Stereo A, a satellite orbiting another Lagrange point. Had it hit Earth, it would have inflicted serious damages to electrical grids and electronics and costed up to $2.6 trillion of damage in the US alone. In 2003, the Sun unleashed a real barrage of CMEs and solar flares that caused power outages in Sweden aircrafts to be rerouted in northern Europe, and satellites to go mute for hours including GPS disruptions. So even if you don't hear much about solar storms, our star is far, far from being asleep. And because these satellites are closer to the sun than we are, they are actually our last line of warning in case we miss to see a CME heading our way. Okay, but if it happens, what can we do? Well. Let's be realistic, even if our equipment and grid are much more protected from the induced currents now than they were in Canada in 1989, and even if we get early warnings now, if a Carrington-like CME hits Earth nowadays, there is not much we can do to protect our equipment. Perhaps we would just unplug them, wait until it passes, then start assessing the damages. Still, warnings are important. General public need to be prepared for potential power outages and know how to survive until equipment are repaired and communications re-established. On their website, NOAA give a 3-day forecast for those events, but also some guidance to prepare for a powerful CME. They advise to freeze water in plastic containers to keep fridges cool, to make some water reserves and to prepare contact lists. They also advise to keep car tanks full. The only things they don't say much about are EVs. But don't rush out to buy provisions yet. While many CMEs and radio bursts already hit Earth this year, they are not really able to predict when severe ones will. Scientists were only able to study two major CMEs impacts so far, the Carrington one and the Great Magnetic Storm from 1582 which was very well documented back then and that left some markers in nature. And there are also traces of much more energetic events than the Carrington one. The scientists call them the Miyaki events. These traces are mainly fossil, in the form of carbon-14 concentration increase in tree trunks or other isotopes. Scientists estimate they happen every 400 to 2400 years, but they also are not certain they are all caused by the sun. For all they know, they could be caused by novas or supernovas, who knows? Maybe the nova expected this year will shed some light on this. So in the absence of strong records, the only two data points that can serve as baseline are the Carrington event and the 1582 one, and they are far from being enough to establish a trend. So that leaves us only one choice, statistics. For that, I found three contradicting studies calculating the likelihood of extreme CMEs. As usual, all links are available below. This one published by the American Geophysics Union in 2011 predicted a 12% likelihood of an extreme CME before 2022. And you might be thinking, no CMEs that extreme hit Earth so far. And you would be right. But let's not forget the 2012 one and all the near misses that we had so far. 
The second and third studies I found are more recent, both from 2019. They were published in Nature and in Geophysical Research Letters. This one calculates the probability of a Carrington-like event hitting Earth for the decade, so I guess before 2030, between 0.46 and 1.88%, while the other one gives 4% for over 14 sun cycles, meaning pretty much no chances. NOAA says that, within a period of 11 years, which corresponds to one sun cycle, Earth gets hit four times on average by a G5 sandstorm. But again, a G5 storm is not necessarily a Carrington event, so our grids are on the safe side. And to impact the optical fibers, a CME would have to be 10 times more powerful than that. So the chances of losing our civilization are perhaps slim. But hey, let's not forget the bright news here. This year and the next could be the years of auroras. My name is Khalid and I talk about interesting science. Thank you for watching. <laughs>